A very good Sunday evening to my friends from Bromley Baptist Church. Hope that you are doing well. Hope that you've had a good day. Uh, I know that I have, and I pray that you have as well. Tonight, we turn our attention back to 2 Corinthians, the very last chapter, and we're nearing the very last verses of 2 Corinthians. So last week, we looked at verses 7 through 10, but we primarily just did the first half of what we're going to talk about today, the pattern of sanctification, obedience, and integrity. And if you'll remember over the past several weeks, we have kind of laid out, okay, what does it look like to be sanctified? What does it look like to be growing and becoming more and more like Christ Jesus? And we've said several ingredients need to be, need to be there for that to be taking place. You have to repent of your sins. You have to be saved. You have to have spiritual disciplines. You have to have someone in authority, a word of God in authority over you, guiding you. You have to be authentically a believer. Uh, be sure you're in the faith. And then last week, we talked about obedience, meaning outwardly. Jesus says multiple times, very, very clearly, if you are my disciples, you will obey my commands. I mean, there's, there's just, there's no way around that. If you love Jesus, you'll do what he says. So from an outward standpoint, that's easy. Now, here's the issue. Just because someone obeys does not mean by itself that they are in the faith. Because we all know of people who one hour a week on a Sunday morning can get up and play the part, play the role, go to church, pretend to be all the things that a follower of Christ truly is, just do it outwardly. Well, that's not enough. We have to be a, a, obviously a believer deep within our heart and the only person in the universe who can know that for sure is God the Father. And so that's what we speak about this week, the inward aspect of this, integrity, integrity. Here's our passage in full, just to kind of reset the stage for us. And we did a big part on obedience and a small part on integrity, and I'll show you why here hopefully in the next few minutes. Now we pray to God that you do no wrong, not that we ourselves may appear approved, but that you may do what is right even though we may appear unapproved. For we can do nothing against the truth, but only for the truth. For we rejoice when we ourselves are weak, but you are strong. This we also pray that you may be made complete. There it is. For this reason, I'm writing these things while absent, so that when I present, so excuse me, so that when present, I need not use severity in accordance with the authority which the Lord gave me for building up and not for tearing down. And here's how we divided the passage last week. Several words about obedience, but then the last phrase is about integrity. That we also pray for that you may be made complete. The quality of integrity is literally another way to say completeness. Same Greek words. Same words that can be translated either of those things simply based on the context they are used in. So we could literally say that we also pray for that you may be ha that you may have integrity, be made complete. That's literally all this means. We've talked about repentance. We've talked about discipline, authority, but catharsis, uh, catharsis is excuse me, complete, which appears here only in the New Testament means adequate fully qualified, qualified or sufficient. The verb form of this same word literally has to do with putting things in their correct order, like in a numbering sort of sense. Matthew 4.21 speaks of James and John mending fishing nets and uses this same verb, making the nets full and complete. Paul uses it in Galatians 6.1 to describe the uh, restoring a fellowship between God and man. So this word is here only, but the verb form of it does pop up in a couple other places, and that gives you an idea of the kind of the semantics of what we're talking about. The English word integrity best expresses, I think, this Greek word catharsis, which is a person whose thoughts, beliefs, words, and actions are all in perfect harmony. Your net is complete. You are fully formed in every way. Your actions, your thoughts, your outward, your inward, all of these things match up and go together. They agree with one another. They are reconciled to one another. You don't say one thing and do something else. Your inward and outward parts agree. 
who you are and what you do are the same. That's integrity. A person with integrity does what you would expect them to do based on their inward behavior, based on their outward appearance and their inward behaviors. Those things go together. That, that, that's what it, inward integrity means. Nothing inconsistent, nothing out of sync. Integrity can be illustrated by the process of baking bread. Let's say you put water, flour, yeast, sugar, salt, all the ingredients in a pan and put it in the oven. What comes out wouldn't be bread necessarily because just because you poured all the ingredients in there, if they weren't complete, if they weren't put together, if they weren't mixed in proper proportions, then those ingredients would never actually produce anything. The same is true in the life of the believer. Just because the ingredients are there, if they are not grown together, if they are not mixed in proper proportion, if they're not agreeing with one another, then a Christian will never produce real, genuine integrity. Now, of course, Christ is our ultimate example of integrity. The Bible says in Hebrews that he knew no sin, yet he became sin for us. But Paul writes to the Galatians in chapter 4, verse 19, and says, my children with whom I'm again in labor until Christ is formed in you. And that's the same idea of we're growing into Christ, our example. Christians should be, be becoming, let me say it correctly, more and more like Jesus Christ. We should be growing in this. And again, that's what sanctification is. That's what integrity is. It's getting these ingredients mixed together, coming together in their proper proportions, in their proper form at the right time. See, if we go back to the illustration about baking bread, you got to have the yeast and the flour and all that stuff, but it has to be in the right mixtures. You have to put it in the right temperature, the circumstances, all these things come together. Well, Christ has provided all of that for us, but as we have labored to say in this lengthy discussion of sanctification over the last seven, eight, nine weeks now, we have a role to play. We have a part to do. And notice what Paul says in verse 10, for this reason, I am writing these things while absent so that when present, I need not use severity in accordance with the authority, which the Lord gave me for building up and not tearing down. Like, this is the point I, I want to, we want to teach these things. We want to know these things so that we never have to come and, and get on someone and say, hey, you ought to be doing these things. You ought to be living this way. The ingredients are there. Like there's nothing your pastor can do to force you to be sanctified. Your ingredients are there, but you have a personal responsibility that no one else can fulfill for you. There are things that you must do that no one else can do for you or on your behalf in order for you to have integrity, to have sanctification, to have the things that you need to be be becoming more like Jesus Christ. So there is a responsibility for each one of us who hear these things to grow integrity inwardly so that we may be more and more like Jesus so that there's no tearing down, but there's only building up. See, some of the Corinthians would not do what they should. And Paul was hoping desperately that they would heed the rebukes he writes in these letters so that when he got there, he would not have to do worse to them to get them back where they should be. Following Jesus is a serious business and we need to take it very seriously. Firmly have a good and godly day and go serve your king.